Hello, and welcome to this Nature Research custom media webcast titled Neoantigen Immunopeptidone Profiling and Production for Personalized Immuno-Oncology Therapeutic Discovery. My name is Joe Shank Harpen, and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is produced by GenScript. We'll begin the webcast with presentations from Dr. Julie Rumble of Cayman Chemical and Raymond Miller of GenScript. We'll then end with a Q&A session. To ask a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit at any point during the webcast and we will answer them today. And now over to Julie. Thank you so much. Today I will be discussing some of the things that we at Cayman have learned about planning different types of immunopeptidome profiling experiments and how to ensure that you get the best possible information from these experiments. Over the past 50 years of research on the treatment of cancer, we have come a very long way in terms of treating and understanding the disease, but there is still so far to go with, with all of these things. The majority of research has focused on finding better toxic chemicals to selectively target cancer cells. But the advent of immunotherapy has turned cancer treatment on its head and led to some of the um, most impressive advances we've ever seen. The immune system is made up of highly specialized cells with exquisite specificity, along with memory of previously encountered antigens. These cells can be taught to seek and eliminate cancer cells, which has begun to reap the rewards of safer and more effective and durable treatments. An important principle that makes immunotherapy to cancer possible is the intrinsically disordered protein expression of cancer cells which can result in the adaptive immune response identifying cancer cells as foreign. So how does immunopeptidome profiling fit in? We can identify these disordered protein signatures that stimulate the adaptive immune response by sequencing the peptides found in the MHC complexes for recognition by T cells. Every cell, normal, tumor, infected, dying, presents peptides derived from endogenous proteins in MHC class one molecules, depicted here by the blue protein with a red peptide. These peptides are typically nine MERS and are how T cells and the TCR here in green determine if that cell is normal. Is it self? Is it virally infected? Is it expressing unrecognizable proteins? If the T cell thinks anything is wrong, that cell is targeted for elimination. Since cancer cells frequently have intrinsic genomic instability and accumulated mutations, there is a possibility of those mut mutated proteins being broken down for presentation in NHC and a T cell recognizing them and initiating immune-mediated destru destruction of the tumor. If we can exploit this to develop treatments, we can induce the body to kill its own cancer. The workflow for immunopeptidome profiling, profiling is as follows. We lyse the cells or homogenize the tumor and immunoaffinity enrich the MHC complexes using antibody conjugated resins. Peptides are gently eluded from the bound complexes and subject to LCM SMS, from which a list of peptides is developed using relevant databases. I will discuss some key considerations for each step in this process. The vast majority of peptides identified in immunopeptidome profiling experiments are derived from normally expressed proteins. But if neoantigen identification is the goal of your experiment, we are looking for a needle in the haystack. The term neoantigen encompasses two different kinds of peptides. Tumor-associated antigens are part of the normal human MHD repertoire, but may not be normally expressed in the tissue the tumor derives from. Identif identification of these would require comparison of tumor tissue with normal tissue peptide lists. Tumor-specific antigens, on the other hand, are derived from completely new proteins, such as indels, translocations, or other mutations, and thus may provide greater potential for immunogenicity. I will briefly discuss some strategies for identifying these later. When making our way through the immunopeptidome profiling workflow, the first step along the way is input. The big question is always, how much material do we need to provide? The best answer we have is usually more is always better. 
I have made a graph here uh, su suggesting why this can be a difficult question to answer, especially with a new cell line or tumor tissue. This graph de depicts MHC concentration in lysates from various cell lines as measured by ELISA. With any given cell line, there can be a tenfold range of how much MHC is expressed in the same number of cells. We frequently recommend starting with at least 100 million cells or 100 milligrams of dried tumor weight. But in some cases, this won't be enough to get a complete picture of the immunopeptidome. We are sometimes asked why we need so much material, but it is important to remember that the sensitivity of this method is intrinsically different from the biological sensitivity of the T cell. A critical choice for experimental design is also the choice of antibodies for the immunoprecipitation step. The most commonly used antibody is W632 because it has broad specificity across human class 1 molecules. There does not exist a comparable pan class 1 antibody for mouse samples, although M142 pulls down several H2 molecules from the most common mouse strains. There are additionally MHC class 2 specific antibody options available, but they have not yet been optimized. It is important to note that in many cases, these IPs can be performed serially to capture both class one and class two, or multiple different alleles from the same sample. Another thing to consider is how any treatments will impact the peptide number. For instance, interferons are sometimes used to upregulate MHC expression, but the question remains how the stimulus may change the repertoire in unanticipated ways. Signaling changes have the distinct potential to be reflected in the immunopeptidome. Conversely, sometimes the goal is to find a treatment that will alter the immunopeptidome and potentially increase the likelihood of generating neoimaging. Many of these treatments will affect MHC expression levels, and the resulting increase in peptide numbers may be due either to the increase in MHC at the surface or an upstream mechanism increasing the repertoire. This may not be a problem, but it is important to note that the number of peptides identified cannot be normalized to the amount of MHC. For example, we performed a study investigating whether commonly used chemotherapeutic drugs could affect the immunopeptidome and possibly can sensitize cancer cells to immune-mediated killing as part of the mechanism of action. When we tested the MHC levels of the treated cells by ELISA, we found that all of the treatments increased the class one expression as compared to untreated cells. This information is interesting by itself, but also underscores that any potential increase in the peptide number with treatments may be a result of greater MHC expression as opposed to generation of neoantigen. Another critical consideration for experimental design is the expected output of the experiment. What mass spec sequencing of peptides essentially provides is a list of masses that must be matched to known proteins before they have any meaning. This means that we need to know what we are looking for in the immunopeptidome. The default database against which pet data are searched is the canonical species database from Uniprot, which will match all normal proteins. Beyond this, we can ask for the analysis program to search for single amino acid changes from norm the normal database to address new antigens that are derived from point mutations. However, any more expansive mutations, such as indels or splice variants or translocation, cannot be found using those tools. These would require addition of mutated sequences from um, other sources, such as transcriptome sequencing or exome sequencing. In the experiment I just described with chemotherapeutic drugs, we used only the canonical human database. As expected, most of the peptides in the center of the Venn diagram on the left were derived from, were common to all the conditions. And then the treatment groups shared more peptides with each other than with the untreated. We also looked at single amino acid changes in the Venn diagram on the right from the canonical human database, which is as close as we could get to neoantigen identification without sequencing trans transcripts. This experiment was an interesting exercise in searching for neoantigens, although we didn't take it all the way to sequencing. Any neoantigens that did pop out of this experiment would need to be validated. So for target validation studies, um, a potential neoantigen would, be, would need to be validated before it can be used in downstream applications. And for this, there are many possible approaches 
to consider. For class one peptides, which are derived from endogenous proteins, which are broken down by the um, proteasome on the left side of this figure um, and transferred in through the uh, TAP protein into the uh, ER um, for loading into the MHC class one. The peptides of interest can be overexpressed in the context of the protein that they are normally found in or as a series of tandem mini genes if a, a number of neoantigens are, are desired. The timing of the expression may be critical in this case as allowing time for the construct to be expressed and the protein to be broken down by the proteasome is necessary. In some cells, cross-presentation of a pinocyte host antigen may be possible or even soluble peptides incubating with cells for a short time to stimulate direct exchange of the peptide at the cell surface. On the other hand, with MHC class II peptides, they are uh, derived from phagocytose proteins, um, and ensuring the efficient uptake of the target is the critical point. Soluble proteins are not taken up very efficiently, typically, so coding Coding latex beads with a target protein may be a more effective method of ensuring uptake and processing through the endolysosomal system. One potentially useful tool to approach target validation is using monoallele expressing cell lines. There are a few cell lines available which have little to no endogenous MHC expression, which can be transfected with single alleles of MHC to create a cell line in which all peptides are specific to that MHC allele. If targets are then added, the ability of those peptides to bind to that specific allele are tested. In our experience, as shown on the right, there can be dramatic variability among alleles. This graph shows that based using ELISA as a readout, the amount of MHC does not necessarily dictate the um, amount of peptides that are recovered from that MHC in the model allele system. Each point here represents a different allele. Um, and as you can see, some alleles with very low expression um, recover very high numbers of peptides, whereas some peptides, some alleles with very high expression recover much lower numbers of peptides. We are currently investigating possible reasons for this and ways to improve recovery with some of these poorer alleles. Thanks, Julie. And now over to Raymond. Well, thank you so much, and thanks to the audience for attending today's webinar. So uh, my name is Ray Miller. I'm a Senior Global Product Manager with Genscript. And what I'm going to talk about today is, is neonogen peptide synthesis, reducing difficult neonogen peptides. Or as I like to think about it, making the difficult simple. So Genscript is a major CRO, and for more than 10 years, we've been in the business of synthesizing custom peptides. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of excitement around the field of neonogen therapeutic development. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are neoantigens. I'm then going to transition to kind of an idealized vision for how neoantigen therapeutic development occurs, and then how Genscript can help, and what are the things that our team are doing to essentially, again, make peptides easy. So neoantigens, um, as previously described, are essentially variants or indels that are expressed in cancer cells, but not within healthy cells. Um, they're expected to be highly tumor-specific, highly patient-specific. And again, the, the definitions of these are kind of varying, as we can see, over time. Uh, but in general, uh, this is what's been reported in the literature. If a neoantigen is really, truly a neoantigen, and it's able to invoke an immune response, it should be expressed, and it should be presented on the surface of the cell. And uh, so obviously, having said that, you can see right away that new antigens are this potential source of both biomarkers for diagnostics, and then also as a potential target for immunotherapies. And I'm gonna focus a little more on the latter versus the former. What is believed is the fact that new antigens are, again, considered not self antigens, they should be highly immunogenic. You know, and that's again, what's driving a lot of the excitement. So when we think about new antigen therapeutic development, a very new area, so apologies, I know this is a growth simplification of a very complex subject. There are two forms of immunotherapy based on neoantigens that are in development today, personalized uh, CAR-Ts 
and then uh, also cancer vaccines. I'm going to focus a little more on cancer vaccines. So again, apologies, kind of an idealized vision for what a personalized cancer vaccine therapeutic development would look like. Starts with the patient. You have a patient. You take a biopsy. You go ahead and you want to find out are there any punitive mutagens within this biopsy and within the sample in the patient? And you do this through a series of whole genome, whole exome sequencing, RNA-seq, in silico prediction, or immunopeptidome profiling. And these are all ways to get at a list of what you think is going to ultimately be a potential therapeutic target. So at this point, you've got your list. You need to confirm it. And as previously mentioned, there are a lot of different ways to do that. One of the ways to do that is to go ahead and take your list and to synthesize peptides encoding neoantigens or so-called neoantigen peptides. You then take these peptides and you run a variety of different tests. You go through some sort of screening to say, okay, is this truly a target that can actually invoke an immune response? And you can do that through a variety of different T cell activation assays, LE slots, flow cytometry, and so on and so forth. If you're developing a vaccine, typically at this point, unless you've already filed your IND and you're, you're well within a clinical trial, you're going to go ahead and you're going to do some animal studies. You're going to do some safety and tox work to really, again, kind of establish your platform. At this point, again, assuming that you're in the midst of a clinical trial, you then say, okay, I've now got a handful of new antigens can invoke an immune response. And I want to challenge the patient's immune system to recognize these, with, of course, the goal being to have the patient's immune system recognize them and attack the cancer. And there are a variety of different vaccine platforms that, again, are under development. In general, there are DNA, RNA, and peptide-based vaccines. For the purpose of our talk, I'll focus a little more on peptide-based personalized cancer vaccines. You essentially take a pool of peptides that are, of course, of the highest quality, you put them into a patient to, again, challenge their immune system to try to recognize these targets. At this point, hopefully you have efficacy. Hopefully the patient responds. And you go ahead and you do some screening afterwards, again, using T-cell activation assays. So one of the key things that, that our company, our team, noticed is that peptides are really responsible or really required for all these different stages, and they're a critical component. And Obviously, that's great. It's great business for us, but at the same time, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for everyone because synthesizing neogen peptides is not a trivial task. And this has been well reported in the literature, um, and uh, it's something that's true across uh, multiple vendors. So why is that the case? Why, why is such a critical component so difficult, so frustratingly difficult to manufacture? And it's really due to a variety of different physiochemical properties. For simplicity's sake, I would count the top three uh, culprits as being length, hydrophobicity, and purity. And in general, what we find here is obviously the longer a peptide is, the more difficult it is to synthesize. And for neonogen peptides, they can range from actually pretty short, 9 to 11 mers, all the way up to 40 mers, again, if you're thinking about a peptide-based personalized cancer vaccine. Hydrophobicity is a huge challenge. There are many, many hydrophobic residues um, on these neonogen peptides, and they're evenly distributed. And that obviously leads to aggregation. It leads to difficulty in solubility. It, it just really makes it very difficult. And then last but certainly not least, purity. So, so why purity? Well, purity is important because a lot of these assays are very sensitive, and you obviously want to measure an immune response you don't necessarily want an immune response due to some sort of, let's say, contaminant or process contaminant. So all these factors together make peptide synthesis difficult. So when we approached this, this market, we said, okay, what can we do better? We'd already taken on a few pilot projects, and we, we'd gotten some success and wanted to improve upon that. And so ultimately what GenScript is doing is we're developing technologies and infrastructure to support the synthesis of these very difficult peptides reliably. And we do that through two broad buckets, bioinformatic tools and chemistry. And overall, by combining both these approaches with our core competence in peptide synthesis, 
we're able to achieve a 95% success rate for the synthesis of neoantigen peptides. And it's worth mentioning that we have a higher success rate when it's more general peptides, but again, this is a very special subset of peptides, and we're focused on really, really delivering a high quality product. Let's get a little more specific. So, um, again, bioinformatic tool wise, we've developed a range of different internal tools that allow us to go ahead to better assess the difficulty of synthesizing a given peptide. And one of our more recent innovations has been our NeoPre algorithm, which essentially takes that list of punitive neoantigens that you have, runs it through our algorithms, and spits out characteristics about the peptide, and then ultimately gives it a very simple score of easy, middle, and hard, or difficult, to synthesize. Again, it's worth emphasizing that difficult does not mean impossible, it just means a slightly different approach. So we have standard production processes, and then we have the extraordinary production processes when needed. So this kind of gives us a benchmark. It also allows us to engage with our collaborators, with our customers, to help guide what the perfect list of peptides is really going to look like. There are always changes we can make. There are always suggestions and modifications. So the goal is to get you your peptide as soon as possible, as efficiently as possible. Here's an example of that. So small number of peptides here, they vary in physiochemical properties, as you can see here, from length to hydrophobicity, difficulty, and then just to kind of show you a little bit about what's behind the scenes, in addition to a score, we're ultimately coming out with, here are the recommended production processes that will follow, whether they're standard or fully automated, as you can see at the very bottom, something that's more semi-automated, or something that is, you know, an R&D project that we would be willing to take on. So it's going to vary depending on the list of peptides, but in general, what's great about this approach is we can right away say, okay, this is how we're going to approach this. This is how we're going to make this for you. So we developed this algorithm, and okay, the proof is in the data. So we have it, we need to validate it. And so we worked with a very small cohort of peptides that we previously synthesized before, and um, we went ahead and said, okay, we know it was easy, we know it was hard, and apologies, this is an older version, so we had just two broad buckets of easy and difficult. You know, is our algorithm accurate? And we found that the algorithm we developed is about 82% accurate at this point. So pretty high confidence. We continue to improve upon this algorithm, but in general, it works. So it works, let's implement it in a real production process. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing about a month's worth of peptide synthesis projects uh, focused around new antigens to be specific, so not kind of the, the bulk of uh, just traditional peptide orders for us, but again, very specific projects. Um, we're looking at a cohort of about 2,300 peptides, and ultimately we're bucketing these based on our neo pre output into difficult, easy, and then ultimately going ahead and bucketing based on length of peptide. And overall, by using this algorithm, by adjusting our production processes, we were able to get to that 95% success rate overall. And you can get a flavor from the right loose column in terms of the overall turnaround time, which is continuing to be a place that we improve on because, again, we recognize that this is one of the huge drivers of not just reliably making peptides, but making them very, very quick. So it's an area of active investment for us. On top of that, on top of bioinformatic tools, we are also working on developing newer chemistries and taking existing peptide synthesis chemistries and implementing them within our you know, production team. And the main chemistries that we use for neoantigen peptide synthesis, although we have more for um, kind of our general pool of projects, are, of course, traditional liquid phase and solid phase peptide synthesis chemistry, and also microwave-assisted, fully automated uh, peptide synthesis, which is our preferred platform for most neonogen peptides. But again, we have many tools in our toolbox that we can leverage. And to kind of illustrate that point, I just wanted to give you a flavor for all the instrumentation and infrastructure that we built in in our production facilities from automated, fully automated synthesizers down to workstations to completely manual on the bench um, and also very, very excellent 
range of purification platforms, of HPLC platforms. We obviously have great QC uh, tests and measurement devices, and we're also obviously able to lyophilize peptides and, and get them sent to you in a way that minimizes any sort of a shipping challenge. So we have all these platforms that we use, again, driven by our bioinformatic tools and our years of experience to really go ahead and reliably synthesize peptides. But again, it doesn't stop just there, as I had mentioned. We'll also continue to invest in newer chemistries as well. And so what I'm showing you, um, and this is fresh off the press data, about three months out there, but still pretty fresh, um, where we are developing a new chemistry. It's a coupling chemistry. Uh, it's really a combination of the reagents, the process, the platforms we're using. We're calling it Hyson. Um, and ultimately, this is a chemistry that we believe is going to ultimately result in a higher success rate for neonogen peptides to be synthesized. It's also improving, we believe, the speed and the overall turnaround time. And on top of that, last but not least, is actually purity as well, which is a nice side benefit. So what you can see is a couple examples here, two peptides that are neonogen peptides from a different project. Uh, I think it's one of our own internal projects. And um, ultimately, what you're comparing is standard production process at the top and then our high sin process on the bottom. And um, as you can see here, uh, we were able to go ahead and first off actually succeed in synthesizing the peptide we were not previously able to synthesize on the left. And we ultimately have a better overall purity uh, even for the one that we were able to go ahead and synthesize. Now, obviously, we can do further cleanup from this. Uh, but again, I think it's a, it's a really, really nice set of set of data here, and it's really promising. So we wanted to say, okay, let's, we've got this new chemistry. It seems promising. Let's, let's, again, let's prove it. And so, again, it's all about making the difficult easy. And so we implemented our high sin chemistry on a couple pilot projects. Uh, one of those projects was we took from that 5% of peptides we've had some challenges with in the past and said, okay, let's try to run these through this new process. Let's see see what we can see, see if we can get an improvement. And yes, we did. First off, we attempted 232 peptides that, again, we were not able to synthesize before, ultimately ended up with 200 out of that that we could with this new process. So quite a nice improvement, just, again, pushing up our overall success rate. On top of that, uh, we had another small pilot project where we took another step set, focused on what we considered extremely hydrophobic peptides. And out of the cohort of 88 peptides, we were able to synthesize 80 of these. All of this leads us to believe that this is a promising new process. We've implemented it within our manufacturing process, and we would typically recommend it to a, a client or collaborator when we think it's appropriate. Of course, we're always open to collaboration. And uh, if there's an exciting project uh, out there that would use this chemistry exclusively, uh, we'd definitely be down to, to talking about that. Um, so again, in summary, what we do at GenScript is we make peptide synthesis easy, and we're making it easier every day by bioinformatics and by newer chemistries. But on top of that, it's not just about, okay, making something. It's about getting it to you the way that you want it to be. And obviously, we have a range of QC tests and options that we can leverage. And at the same time here, again, since Neonogen um, research and development is, is of course, ever-changing, and there's an emphasis on finding out exactly what makes a perfect new engine, we expect a lot of modifications. It's not going to be just as easy as pulling up your list. You're going to do a little bit more refinement on that, especially if you talk about uh, TCR antigen um, uh, binding assays. And so obviously we have many different options to help with the screening of that. So thank you, Ray, for that um, detailed description of peptide synthesis. That's wonderful. I am going to talk about the services that um, Cayman can provide within the immunopeptidome, profi immunopeptidome profiling space. Um, we have a whole suite of services um, that I touched on in my section of the, the webinar. Starting with antibody production, we can make new hybridomas, we can culture existing hybridomas and s synthesize or uh, produce antibody in, in great quantities. We can do cell culture uh, in large quantities. Obviously, I, I spoke about how large numbers of cells are required. We can, we can culture billions of cells. 
Um, and we can transfect those cells. We can do large-scale transfection of MHC alleles in the, in the um, context of monoallele uh, experiments, as well as transfecting targets in, in other contexts. Um, we can obviously do immunoprecipitation, as I have showed, and we do mass spec-based sequence analysis. We have over 150 skilled scientists and we are dedicated to having a personalized and flexible approach with each client and are committed to quality data and reporting and high levels of transparency. Well, thanks, Julie. And uh, want to also say really excited about this partnership between Cayman and GenScript. Um, obviously, as I think everyone can see, there's a lot of synergy between your offering and our offering as well. Um, just as a very, very quick recap on GenScript's offering, uh, again, we're focused on being a major and our major peptide synthesis CRO. Uh, we've been doing this for more than 10 years at this point, and in particular, we're really passionate about the area of neonogen therapeutic development and are obviously always continuing to look to improve and to expand. In general, what, what we bring to the table is we really are able to make peptides reliably. You know, we are a trustworthy partner for you in the synthesis of these peptides. We overall had a tremendous success rate and continue to improve upon that. And ultimately, we're able to give you what you want the way you want it. We're able to give you that flexibility. That way you can further and accelerate your research and development efforts. And uh, I thank you uh, for Thank you for your presentations, Raymond and Julie. It is now time for the Q&A. To ask the speakers a question, just type it in where it says ask a question and then press submit. So our first question, and uh, this one is directed to you, Julie. Uh, and it asks, um, does the peptide profiling change with age or disease type? Thank you, Jayshan. That's a very good question. Um, while age or disease may change the uh, number of peptides that are identified, it won't actually change the, the fundamental process or, or the workflow. Um, but because we can't predict the amount of MHC that may be in um, different diseases, say lung cancer versus colon cancer or, or really anything, um, we always say more is better. But that was a very good question. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Julie. Uh, our next question um, is also directed to you. And this one asks, um, how long does it take to go through the process from biopsy to result? Yeah, that's, uh, that's another good one. Um, so typically, um, once we get a tissue or a cell pellet, um, we say that it'll take us between four and six weeks to turn that around until you have a um, list of peptides. Excellent. Thanks, Julie. Um, our next question, I think, asks, um, has there been a comparison between uh, using a neoantigen for personalized immuno-oncology therapeutics and using um, engineered T cells? Uh, both methods seem to be able to create a, a sort of personalized cancer therapy. Um, who would like to take that one? I can go ahead and take that one. This is Ray. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. It's an excellent question, and I don't really have a firm answer. Um, to be honest, um, right now folks are trying both approaches. Uh, I would say for the cancer vaccines, uh, the idea is to use them in combination with checkpoint inhibitors to try to improve efficacy. Uh, there are trials ongoing right now. Dana-Farber, for example, has one, and there are a couple of trials that I'm aware of that are about to start at this point. Some initial data looks pretty promising, but no one has done a direct comparison for personalized T cell therapy. The, the leading um, voice in that field is really Pat Pharma, and I think they're going through their phase 1B is what I want to say at this point. Um, so I think it's a really compelling question, and I'm looking forward to see a comparison on efficacy and see what approach is going to be best for the patients. 
Excellent. Thanks, Ray. Uh, our next question asks, um, what is the, and I always stumble across this word, um, so what is the cost of the immunopeptidomics as a service? Thanks, Jason. Yes, it's uh, immunopeptidomics. <laughs> um, so the cost can actually vary um, fairly dramatically um, based on um, what is the input. Um, tissues are a little bit more work intensive, um, whereas um, a cell pellet um, is a little bit less. Um, different antibodies have a little bit of a different cost uh, associated with them, but um, if we were to um, put in a, a very, very rough estimate, <laughs> um, we typically tell people um, it would be in the range of about $3,800 per sample. Um, although it can be less, um, there is a certain amount of cost savings with, um, with more samples. Um, but really, um, the, the best thing to, that I can say about, um, about the cost is that we, we, we really love to talk to you, um, and, uh, try to figure out the, the best way to do the experiment, um, and the best way to, um, move forward in the, uh, most cost effective manner. So thank you for that. Perfect. Thanks, Julie. Uh, our next question asks, um, how long does it take to synthesize um, clinically relevant um, amounts of peptides? Another fantastic question. Um, so, so right now, given the fact that, uh, and by clinically relevant, I'm assuming that the, the questioner is asking about peptides that would be used as part of a vaccine and be an active pharmaceutical ingredient to reduce that quality of peptide. Uh, the current turnaround time for everyone that's on market is about four to six months at this point. So it's a huge barrier, um, and it's something that uh, there was a really fantastic paper from Dana-Farber, I want to say about two months ago, that really kind of dives in on this topic. Uh, but it's a huge barrier for making personalized vaccines uh, a reality. Uh, there are some newer approaches that are in development to try to reduce that turnaround time, but obviously while maintaining the strict quality of the active pharmaceutical ingredient, not compromising on that. So again, about four to six months for a dose for a patient. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. I think the next question is for you um, as well, and it asks them, what are the typical uh, amounts and number of aliquots required for screening and initial research purposes? So for initial screening, the amounts are actually quite modest. We're looking in the microgram scale. Um, depending on the number of screens, depending on how many confirmatory tests you want to do, you can get up to a couple of MIGs but that's typically the amount that most of our, our customers and collaborators uh, uh, typically request. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. Uh, our next question asks, um, can neoantigens have uh, PTMs or are those removed during um, cellular processing? Um, Julie, is that something you can help answer? Yes, yes, that, I'll take that one. Um, so this is a great question. This is actually something that we are actually actively investigating right now. Um, we do see uh, significant numbers of PTMs um, on uh, the immunopeptides that we generate or that we ID um, in in many of our in a, many of our applications, um, and most of them are actually very easy to find. Um, one thing that we are actively looking at right now is um, glycosylation modifications, um, and that's something we're we're very interested in looking at. We we haven't um, actually started that process yet. Um, we know that um, O-linked modifications are typically transferred all the way through. Um, the proteasome and uh, into the MHC uh, cleft and onto the surface, um, while N-linked modifications are are actually not and may actually have a negative effect on um, proteolytic processing. Um, other post-translational modifications that we've seen, um, we see some citrullination and acetylation and um, 
that's definitely something that we we can look at um, and are definitely interested in um, in pursuing. So it's a very good question. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Julie. Our next question asks: um, Is there a bias for successful um, profiling with different HLA types? Um, Julie, is that something you can help answer? Yes. Yes, I think that's for me as well. Um, yeah, so w we believe, well, there's there's a lot of different ways to answer this question, of course. Um, so the antibody that we use the most often is W632, um, and that is a um, so-called pan-human class one antibody. Um, while everybody considers it to be pan-class pan one, I, I fully believe that there is probably some bias um, in its ability to bind to different HLA types. Um, although we haven't really nailed down um, exactly uh, which ones it may be more or less uh, able to bind. Um, however, we have been able to pull down um, a lot of different HLA types successfully with this um, with this antibody. Um, but that being said, there are um, there is the ability to develop custom antibodies um, if there's a specific HLA type um, that you're interested in. Um, there are some antibodies already out there for very specific HLA types. Um, so again, it's all about having the conversation about exactly what you're looking for. Excellent. Thanks, Julie. Our next question asks, um, what is the typical purity required for T-cell activation assays? Um, Ray, is that something you can help answer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for a typical T-cell activation assay, um, if you're working with a patient sample, so for example, you've gone ahead and administered some treatment and you're trying to measure an immune response, um, I've typically seen uh, most of our collaborators request extremely high purities because obviously this is this is something incredibly important. It's something where you can't go back to the patient and necessarily get another sample. And so for there, we're typically looking at about 98% purity for peptides. So as pure as humanly possible. The benefit of doing that is the fact that there's always the chance that uh, uh, the immune response that you might measure from a T-cell activation assay is perhaps less about the, the peptide invoking the response versus other potential process uh, impurities. Uh, so as pure as you can get it. For kind of a average kind of initial screen, uh, I would recommend something in the lines of about 85% purity, which typically works good enough, again, for the purposes of that initial screen. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Our uh, next question asks, um, how are peptides used for screening after sequencing? I can take that one as well. So, so typically, once you've gone ahead and you've identified kind of a list of, of uh, punitive uh, neoantigens by way of whole exome sequencing and typically RNA-seq, uh, there's a lot of... Um, uh, in silico prediction that's being done. Most of the in silico prediction platforms really don't have a very high positive success rate at predicting a new antigen. So that's ultimately requiring you to go ahead and do a screen. So a uh, typical screening assay is uh, for a given, let's just say, patient individual. You're looking at probably screening around three dozen, I would say, three dozen new antigens and uh, obviously having the corresponding peptides associated with that. And you'll typically run a uh, LE spot assay. Uh, flow cytometry is increasingly being used for that purposes, but LE spots are still the predominant approach that folks use. It's a quick and dirty and easy assay to execute on. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. Our uh, next question asks, uh, what kind of samples can Cayman use for uh, immunopeptidome uh, analysis? Uh, Thanks, Jason. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, we can um, we can use uh, tissues. We can use um, cell lines. Um, we are currently capable and have validated methods for um, both human and mouse, uh, class one and class two. 
of various different um, uh, MHC types. Um, and um, we have, we are actually in the process of um, trying to develop uh, assays to um, to IP more um, different species, such as canine and rat, um, although we do not have those um, completely validated yet. Excellent. Thanks, Julie. Our uh, next question asks, uh, are GMP peptides required for neoantigen therapeutic R&D? A uh, very, very good question. Um, so, so my response to that would be uh, typically for early research and development, um, and typically for any application that does not involve direct work with humans, is not in vivo with humans, sample with humans, um, GMP quality peptides are not required. Uh, typically, I've seen for almost all the parts of a personalized therapeutic uh, workflow or development process, typically RUO grade or perhaps a slight scale above that to kind of a preclinical grade material is typically more than sufficient. Uh, again, for the record, obviously, if you're working directly with a patient or uh, planning on eventually entering a clinical trial, at that point, you would have a much stricter criteria for the quality of material that you would use as your active pharmaceutical ingredient. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. Our next question asks, um, on average, how um, many um, neoantigen peptides are identified in a tumor sample? Um, Julie? Yeah, hi. Um, that is a, that's a good question, and it, it really varies, varies a lot um, with the size of the tumor sample that we got. Um, and also with the type of tumor and, you know, the amount of maybe immune infiltrate or um, there's, there are so many things that, that go into the, um, the number of peptides that we're actually able to recover. Um, but I would say that we have gotten up to six or 7,000 peptides um, out of, you know, a, a tumor sample of um, under half a gram. Um, so it 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 really does um, vary tremendously, um, but we we out of every tumor sample we've done, we've gotten at least a few thousand peptides. Excellent, thanks, Julie. Our next question asks: um, How are Cayman and uh, Gene uh, scripts working together to address? Um, clients' needs in the neoantigen ID area? I can start the answer to that and then maybe hand it off to Ray. Um, so when a client approaches us about immunopeptidome sequencing, the final result of the experiment will be a list of peptides, um, whether it be a list of neoantigen, potential neoantigen peptides, or the entire list of peptides um, that can be mined for potential neoantigens. Um, whether they're either tumor-associated neoantigens or even the tumor-specific neoantigens. Um, this list can then go to GenScript, and Ray can take it from here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that upfront identification is so important uh, because obviously that's going to feed into your further downstream process for really finding out what could be a potential therapeutic target. Uh, I mean, the, the way that, that we kind of take it on our end here is provide you with the material that you would need to go ahead and to validate those initial hits. Um, you know, because again, obviously, if you're going to ultimately develop a therapeutic or even just to, let's say, a, d develop a diagnostic test, you want to have that confidence, you know, that ultimately this is something real, this is something valid. And uh, our peptides can help you do that. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Ray, and thanks, Julie. Our next question asks, uh, how sensitive is mass spectrometry uh, to identify neoantigens? Um, th there's, been, th th there's been most, uh, as most of the papers um, fail to identify them. Um, Julie, is that something you can help answer? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that um, the mass spec is, 
uh, it's constantly evolving and we are constantly working on um, new methods to uh, increase the sensitivity of the mass spec uh, methodology. Um, but I think that um, always what goes into the, the answer to this question is, is what you're starting with. Um, so we need a, a really a tremendous amount of material uh, in order to uh, identify relatively rare neoantigens um, to start with. And in addition, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, the neoantigens are not something that are going to be found in a, um, a normal human database. And so what you start with as far as the database input is absolutely critical um, for actually finding true neoantigens. Um, because if you start with just a normal human, well, you're not going to find mutations. You're not going to find the um, splice variants. You're not going to find um, any of these things. Um, so I think that the the input is really the the critical thing, and I and I think that the field is evolving right now to figure out how to actually um, best identify these neoantigens. Thanks, Julie. Um, our next question uh, asks, um, how do I get started? Um, Ray, um, Julie, um, who, who would like to say that one? I mean, I, I could go give it a, a shot, and uh, Julie, if you want to chime in, please please do so. Uh, I mean, it's a great question. I, I think that for both Cayman and for GenScript here, uh, the best way to start a conversation is to do a reach out. Um, I believe we can share after this uh, um, uh, Q and A session some specific, you know, addresses and locations to to kind of uh, be able to connect with the right people, uh, start a discussion in terms of the project that you have in mind, and then um, you know, essentially kind of outline, you know, the support that we can offer and how we can execute on that project. Um, I mean, Julie, I think we have a landing page uh, hosted on Cayman Chemical, is that right? Uh, Julie, are you still with us? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, um, we can get started with um, the Cayman landing page, which there is a QR code in the resources section of this webinar um, that will take you there. Um, and on that landing page, there is a link to GenScript. So if you would like to start with GenScript, you can start with, um, with them, or you can start with us um, at Cayman. And um, I believe there are a, several other resources in that, in that resources section that tell you a little bit more about we, what, what we can do, what we have done, um, and how to get a hold of us. Excellent. Well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. I would now like to thank Dr. Julie Rumble and Raymond Miller for their presentations and for answering your questions. And of course, you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon.